prosthesis from the ancient uh, Greek word meaning addition, application, or attachment. If you look up prosthetist in Wikipedia or the dictionary, uh, you will see the definition is a person who measures, designs, fabricates, fits, services, a prosthesis as prescribed by a licensed physician. That's a pretty dry definition of what you do for a living, I think. Um, and as I was writing this talk, I was trying to think of what, what is it that we really do. Um, we're sculptors. We mold uh, people's limbs after amputation. Uh, we are technicians. We get to design and build prosthetic limbs. Uh, we are therapists. We are the first people that uh, get somebody up to walk uh, with a prosthesis for the first time. Uh, we're advocates. Uh, we are constantly uh, fighting insurance companies for coverage. Um, and we're also, we, we become friends uh, with a lot of the people that we treat. Um, you see your surgeon for about an hour. You see your prosthetist the rest of your life. I didn't intend to go to college to do prosthetics. I went to college to do biology. All right, is there anyone here tonight who's studying biology? Please don't be offended. Um, but I hated it, okay? Back in the 80s, yes, I am that old. Uh, back in the 80s, um, biology and particularly marine biology was, was very popular, it was very trendy. Um, there was uh, Jacques Cousteau, the famous French uh, marine biologist, and he was always somewhere exotic on a beach, you know, examining the sex life of lobsters or something. But I liked biology, I liked life sciences, so off I went to do biology. And I was miserable, hated it, and thank God one of my professors plucked me out of the class after six months and said, okay, Arthur, you've you got to pick something. This is not for you. I said, is it really obvious? He said, only when you're sleeping, okay? So he very kindly pointed me in the direction of uh, the prosthetic school, and they very kindly accepted me, and that was going to be the, the rest of my life. I didn't really know that at the time. So... Off to prosthetic school I went and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I love it, I have a passion for it, and I wanna share some of that with you tonight. So let's talk a little bit about lower extremity amputations um, because that is about 95% of all the amputation surgeries that go on. Um, there are approximately 10 million uh, amputees in the world, about 1.3 million in the States. So let's talk a little bit about the past. Uh, I know my talk is the future, but you know, to understand the future, we have to understand the past. Um, if we look back in history, um, there's obviously evidence that uh, prosthetics have been around for a long time. And if you remember, there was a, a, an article, I think it was in National Geographic, uh, about a year or two ago, where they had found evidence about 1500 BC uh, from Egypt, uh, where there was some prosthetic restoration. Uh, not quite full French manicure, but still pretty good. Um, and it obviously showed that the humble prosthetist uh, was around uh, in these times. Um, we think that it was probably someone who was doing shoes or sandals or shoe fitting um, uh, that, that, that was crafting uh, these devices. And then we move on a little bit uh, to Roman times. Again, there's some evidence dug up in some of the, the ruins that uh, there was uh, some prosthetic limbs being provided. Uh, the thought is that in those times it was really probably to people that had the money to pay for it. Um, it wasn't particularly prevalent. And also, your chances of surviving amputation in those days was pretty low. Um, amputation techniques were pretty basic, uh, usually involving a blunt or not so blunt instrument. Um, Post-amputation treatment was really not uh, very well developed. And of course, there was nothing to fight infection. So most of the amputees probably didn't survive, which is too bad. Um, and then we move on a little bit. We go through the Dark Ages. Um, so-called because there really wasn't much in the way of progress. Uh, there was developments like the, the peg leg that we've all seen in the Disney movies, the hook hand that we've all seen in the Disney movies. But really in this period there wasn't much in the way of uh, technological development. And then we got to the Renaissance and that's when things really started to change. And as we move through that period from the 16th, 17th, 18th century, um, I saw a description of it being called agony and surgery. Um, the agony being that again, there was no pain medication, so amputation was a pretty brutal uh, surgery. Um, and again, the survival rates were pretty low until the development of tourniquets and then uh, antiseptic techniques. Uh, your survival rates uh, were still uh, very, very low. However, 
the design of the prosthesis itself was really starting to take some shape and some form. And you can see in this picture here, uh, which was um, from about uh, 1750, 1760, we have devices that are actually starting to take some human form. So not content with fighting the British, you guys decided to fight yourself. So the Civil Wars um, produced a very large number of amputees. Um, now again, we were starting to get tourniquets, uh, some antiseptic techniques. Um, so survival rates were really starting to climb. Uh, James Edward Hanger was a Civil War veteran and he was also an amputee. And this started the trend of amputees really are the people who come up with most of the good inventions. And you'll see some of that as we go through the talk tonight. Uh, James invented an articulating prosthetic foot, which was the first of its kind. He then went on to establish a Hanger, which is now the world's largest uh, prosthetic company with uh, close to a thousand uh, facilities. Um, so from humble beginnings uh, became something really uh, huge. Um, wars are actually pretty good for the prosthetics business in terms of development. Um, it raises awareness, it creates a large number uh, of patients all at one time. And these patients are usually in the public eye and uh, you know, are, are, are front and center. Um, particularly after World War II, uh, we saw the development of the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I think, in my opinion, most of the, you know, what I would call the, the, the modern developments uh, from 1945 onwards, uh, all came as, uh, as funding uh, through the Department of Veterans Affairs. If we look up in the top left corner there, uh, prosthetic foot, that design really didn't change much from about the 1800s through to about uh, 1970, maybe. Uh, it was a pretty basic design. It was a wooden core with rubber toes, and it had some uh, flexion and some motion. Uh, but it really didn't have much in the way of energy storing uh, capabilities. Uh, it was really pretty basic in terms of uh, ambulation. In the 80s, um, on the right-hand side there, you'll see a, a, a carbon composite foot. Uh, there was a very well-known amputee called Van Phillips, uh, who was a blow in the amputee and was fitted with uh, a prosthesis, a prosthetic foot similar to the one on the left. He was very dissatisfied with it. He had a background in carbon fiber and composites, and he went into his garage and emerged two years later with something that resembled this J-shaped carbon foot, which has become um, the, the design parameter pretty much for most uh, high-activity prosthetic feet that we see today. So again, from an amputee came an absolute you know, lightning bolt of an idea uh, that, that really uh, moved the field forward. Uh, again, there wasn't much in the way of uh, development um, up until, oh, probably just after World War II. Uh, up until then, simple hinge designs, sim single axis knees, as we would call them. Um, after World War II, there was a lot of uh, unemployed engineers. Uh, we weren't making planes and bombers anymore. So some of that hydraulic technology uh, was applied to prosthetics. And we had some pretty sophisticated hydraulic technology um, applied to prosthetic knee joints that was very successful and used uh, up until uh, about the, uh, the early 1990s. Um, in the 90s, that's when things really, really started to change. Uh, we started to see the development of microprocessor controlled uh, knee joints. Uh, so these would be for someone with an above the knee amputation. And what's so special about microprocessor knee? If we look back at the, the last slide there, mechanical knee joints depend on the, the patient or the amputee having voluntary control of the, of the knee. So you have to concentrate. So if you're walking and there's cobblestones and there's objects in your way, you're constantly thinking about where you're placing the foot. Uh, and I had a patient who explained it to me. He said, it's, it's like trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. It's hard. Um, Microprocessor-controlled knee joints take away a lot of that thinking for the, for the patient. Inside the, the prosthesis itself uh, are sensors that can detect uh, motion of the knee, loads, um, speed. Uh, and it feeds all that information back into a, a tiny little chip in the knee, and that tells the knee how much resistance to have at any given time. So all of a sudden now the knee has some intelligence, it has some stumble control, and what does that mean for the patient? They don't fall so much. That's a good thing, that's a really good thing. So when we switch to microprocessor knees, 
we immediately saw a, a, a huge uh, drop in the number of patient-related falls. Um, a little video here of a microprocessor knee here. So the patient can place the prosthesis out in front of them, land on it, and not have the knee collapse as it would with a mechanical joint. Um, so that's some of this, the intelligence in the knee, and it's also you know, just demonstrating some of the stumble recovery. And again, this was, you know, the first lightning bolt was the carbon fiber foot. The second lightning bolt was the microprocessor knee. And the technology starts to build. It, it really starts to develop. Then we jump into the next big thing, powered prosthetics. We're getting closer. We're getting closer to be able to join man with machine. This is the first commercially available powered ankle joint. And if any of you have seen the TED talk by Hugh Herr from MIT, who is the designer, um, he wears a pair of these in that talk. So what we have is a prosthetic foot that now has a, an onboard motor. It has gyros, it has accelerometers, it has load sensors. It's a very sophisticated device. What it's able to do is to replicate the action of your gastric muscle, your calf muscle, and your Achilles tendon. Okay, so conventional prosthetic feet react to you loading the foot and you get some spring back. With a powered prosthetic foot, as you come through, the motor fires and actually fires your leg forward. Uh, and we can have some fun with patients when we're doing that. We can really set the load up. <laughs> How's that working for you? Great! Um, but it's the one thing that, it's the one thing that a below the knee amputee can't do. They, they can't push themselves up on their toes. You, you've, lost that, you've lost that ability. Um, so that was, again, lightning bolt number three, powered ankle prosthetics. Lightning bolt number four, powered knee. You can play that, please, Andrew. Um, the Oser powered knee was the first commercially available powered knee. And this uh, young lady here gave a great demonstration last year climbing uh, nice. multiple oh, floors no. uh, of a high rise. And if you see, when she places her foot on the step, the knee pushes into extension, and it also powers into flexion. So for the first time, you actually have a prosthetic knee joint that can lift you up step over step. And I've seen some early fittings down at Walter Reed where they've matched powered knee with a powered ankle. Now, that's fun to watch. Um, so again, this is where the technology is going. So that's about four lightning bolts so far. You keep in count? So where did, all, where did all this lead to? Um, RIC, Rehab Institute of Chicago last year, um, showed us this video, which is a prototype of a powered prosthesis with a powered knee and a powered ankle. However, there's a twist, lightning bolt number five. This prosthesis is triggered by EMG signals in the patient's residual muscles. So we're getting closer, we're getting closer. Step over step downstairs, step over step upstairs. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, is it commercially available? Not yet, but again, probably four or five years, that's what we're going to see. Okay, let's talk a little bit about a little sidebar here. Probably lightning bolt number five and a half. Um, osseo integration. Any of you got any uh, dental implants, crowns? That technology has been around for a while. Um, implanting a titanium implant into the bone and then attaching a, 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 a tooth to it. Uh, well, in Europe, and in particular in Scandinavia, uh, they have done a lot of work um, on implanting um, titanium uh, pegs into the femur of an above-the-knee amputee. What is the, yeah, it's kind of funky looking, but um, it gets rid of the interface that goes on the patient. Wait a minute, that's what I do. Uh oh. Um, we still need to be here to do this bit, the attaching bit. Okay, so I still have a job, that's good. Um, but the osseo integration uh, creates uh, a situation for the patient where they can quickly uh, engage and disengage the prosthesis and they don't have to deal with the socket, with the interface. Um, so, downside um, it takes about six months to heal from the surgery. And then for the next six months, you're in a limited weight-bearing schedule all the way up to full weight-bearing. Um, and I don't think our healthcare system here is going to allow for 12 months off work while your leg heals, unfortunately. Um, but 
if this process could be made faster, um, who knows, it might be a, it might be a possibility. Uh, I have a slide, the next slide here actually shows uh, two patients, uh, both osteointegration subjects. The patient on the left is two years post-surgery. The patient on the right is two weeks post-surgery or cleared for walking post-surgery. I want to talk a little bit about upper extremity amputation. I know it's only about 5% of what we do uh, in terms of patient care, but it's, uh, it's, very, it's very complex. Um, you can wear a prosthetic leg and you can have your pants covering the prosthetic leg and nobody would really know unless you wanted to disclose that fact. If you have an upper extremity amputation, it's there. It's front and center. Whether it's one finger, two fingers, a hand below the elbow, above the elbow, you can't get away from it. So it's a very different picture um, from lower extremity. Up until the late 60s, um, upper extremity limbs were cable driven uh, with harnesses. Um, they were pretty effective in terms of function. Um, but they had limitations. You, know, you couldn't operate a, a prosthesis at full stretch because you'd already stretched the cable. You had a very small work envelope, as we call it. Um, so in the 60s, there was work done in uh, developing a prosthesis that could pick up EMG signals from your extensors and your flexors and use those signals um, to switch uh, a motor uh, in a hand. And the myelectric prosthesis was born. Um, the early units were very bulky and battery technology was a separate backpack and things like that. Um, but the technology has been developed and developed over the last 20, 30 years. Um, early uh, myelectric hands had very simple function. It was a thumb and two fingers, a three jaw chuck grasp. And that was pretty much all the hand could do. Open, close, open, close. But it was completely independent. You could do this out from your body. You could do it above your head. You could do it out to the side. There was no cables. There was no harness. It was quite a liberating uh, experience for a lot of upper extremity amputees. If we look at how that has developed, um, this video here shows the, the, the very latest um, design, which is a uh, multifunction hand. So now each finger has its own motor. Um, Go ahead and move it. And we have a user positional, positionable thumb. And according to the manufacturer, there's a total of 24 grip patterns that you can now have as opposed to one grip pattern. Uh, so a huge development, um, and there is even more work actually in research right now um, to give us powered wrist flexion and rotation as well as multi-hand function. The higher up we come in terms of amputation, the more joints we have to replace. Uh, if we're talking above the elbow transhumeral or a shoulder disarticulation, now we're talking hand function, wrist function, elbow function, shoulder function. It becomes very, very complex we need more inputs to the different motors to be able to achieve the desired function. Um, Rehab Institute of Chicago, again, um, began a program a few years ago with Dr. Todd, Ky Todd Kaiken uh, called Targeted Muscle re -innervation. So if we think of someone who's a, above the elbow uh, amputee, the motor nerves and sensory nerves are still there. Okay? They're just not connected to anything. So what the reinnervation does is identifies those nerves and then reattaches them to, in this case, uh, the pectoral muscle. They'll fillet the pectoral muscle into different pieces and they'll reinnervate using these motor and sensory nerves. So now if you have a, a, an innervate, a TMR patient and you ask them to imagine you're flexing your elbow, they'll trigger that nerve. There'll be a, a, a twitch on the, on the chest wall that can be picked up by an EMG and all of a sudden, we have the elbow body. So we're getting closer to what the media like to call thought-controlled prosthesis, but it, it, it's certainly, that's the way it's heading. Um, so TMR has been a, an absolute lightning bolt and a half um, of a development. Um, downsides, it's more surgery. A lot of patients don't want to go back under the knife after they've had their amputation, and who could blame them? However, the patients that I have seen and the, and the results that I have seen over the years for those that have stuck through it have been really uh, tremendous. It just gives us much more control uh, and a lot more inputs into the prosthesis. And this video here shows a, a young lady who was actually a, a, an Iraq war veteran, uh, Claudia. And she is a, a, a TMR patient. And as you can see from the video here, um, She's got multiple arm functions going on here. She has elbow flexion extension. She has wrist rotation. Uh, she has independent thumb movement. She has finger movement. And as this video goes on, you'll actually see that she has uh, shoulder movement uh, forward, um, 
which is something that's very, very hard to do with a conventional prosthesis. So she's able to operate the prosthesis at a very extended rate. Um, and this uh, prototype that she's wearing uh, was actually designed and built in Manchester by Decca Corporation. A lot of you will be familiar with Dean Kamen and Decca Corporation. Uh, they were funded through the uh, DARPA uh, agency uh, to produce the, the Luke Skywalker arm was the name they put on it. Um, but uh, incredible piece of uh, equipment. Um, and uh, my company was actually, we were actually given the job of designing the clinical interface. Uh, engineers are great. I love engineers. They come up with some great ideas. And they, they bring all this hardware up and they go, here it is. And the patients say, and they go, well, how, do we, uh, how do we attach it? Oh, you guys figure that out. We'll be back in two weeks. <laughs> So now we've got to design an interface that will support, you know, eight pounds of arm, um, multiple inputs. Um, so it becomes, uh, becomes quite an interesting process. In 1974, uh, I was 10 years old, and my favorite thing on a Saturday afternoon was watching that Six Million Dollar Man. Hands up if you've seen an episode of the Six Million Dollar Man. Yes, I thought I was going to be the only one. Um, it was corny. It was really corny. But Steve Austin, I can remember, I can even hear the theme music, da, 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 da. We can rebuild him. Um, this was an astronaut who lost two legs, an arm, an eye, and he was rebuilt, and he was, he was the world's first bionic man. And I think adjusted for inflation, I did the math, it's going to be at 32 million now. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I can't say for sure that that inspired me to go into the field of prosthetics, but I know... Saturday afternoon at 5 o'clock, I was, I was glued to this. I was fascinated by it. Which brings me to the last point that I want to make today. Um, I was very fortunate um, that a very kindly professor plucked me out of a, a, a subject that I was miserable in and, and guided me to something that I, I, I hope I'm good at, um, that I love. Um, the prosthetic field is going to be dramatically understaffed. Um, our... Uh, association has done studies, and with the way the diabetic population is going um, and the obesity trends, um, the guesstimate was by about 2025, we're going to be about a 35, 40% shortfall in clinicians. So if you know someone who's 17, 18 years old and looking for a career where they get to work with people, they get to make things, they get to work with the cool stuff, um, they get to do TED Talks. Um, <laughs> Talk to them about prosthetics. It is unique, I think, in the healthcare field, and it's something that often gets overlooked. And with that, I'm going to thank you, and uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. <laughs>